What I want to do here is to show you an abbreviated neurological examination where you'll pick up most things, not everything, but most things that you're likely to encounter in the accident emergency department. One of the very best signs that we have in neurology is to ask the patient to put their hands out in front of them. If you ask them to do it quickly, then you'll pick up one sign. David, can I ask you to put your hands up straight in front of you quickly? You can see that they went quickly, both together, and stayed together. Now, if you put your hands down again. If, on the other hand, when you ask the patient to lift their arms up quickly, one arm oscillates up and down a little, just don't do that, that's a cerebellar sign. So you'd be suspicious that he could have a right-sided cerebellar problem. Put your arms down again for us. Another sign that we might see is if you ask the patient to put their hands out in front of them, just do that for us please David, and it drifts slowly downwards, you're testing the frontal lobe. That's a weakness. And the third sign that you might see by this test is looking at parietal lobe function where the hand will turn slightly outwards and drift upwards. So we can show that David please. So if you can put your hands down. So with just that one simple test, You've tested frontal lobe, parietal lobe, and cerebellum. The next test that we like to do is the visual fields. There's one thing that you could miss by doing this. Just tell me which finger moved. Both. Which one moved? Both. That's testing both the occipital lobe and the parietal lobe. But the one thing you could miss is monocular blindness. If you could cover your right eye, please. Which finger moved? Both. So it's important to measure the visual acuity in each of the eyes, you can put your hand down, before you do that testing. If the patient has a hemianopia, then when you give them double simultaneous stimuli, they won't see one finger moving until you get it to the midline, in both the lower and the upper quadrant. On the other hand, if they have a parietal lobe problem, then they won't see it when you do it simultaneously, but if you do one side separately, they'll see both. But when again you do it simultaneously, they won't see it. That's called visual inattention, and that's a very prominent parietal lobe sign indicating pathology on the contralateral side. The other test that we can do for parietal lobe function is double simultaneous stimuli of sensation. So what we would do here is we would ask which arm do I touch? In a normal person, they would appreciate that you're touching both arms at once. If the patient has very severe impairment of sensation down that left side, they may not feel you touch their left arm at all. And if they can't, then you can't use double simultaneous stimuli to interpret that they have a parietal lobe function problem. On the other hand, if you stimulated one side and the other and they felt them both and then when you stimulated simultaneously they could only feel the right side or the left side, then that's sensory inattention and again a strong indicator of contralateral parietal sensory loss or sensory inattention it's called. So we've just done three simple tests and we've been able to look at the occipital lobe, the parietal lobe, the frontal lobe, and the cerebellum. If someone has weakness due to a central nervous system problem, in other words, it's an upper motor neuron pattern of weakness, then the first place that it will affect is the hands in the upper limbs. The way to test this is to ask the patient to put their fingers together, bend their fingers back up towards them, you place your knuckles across their little finger and your little finger across their knuckles and you both push as hard as you can. Push really hard and that's normal. In a patient with upper motor neurone weakness, I would be able to overcome that easily. They would also have weakness of finger abduction. Most people test strength in the hands by asking the patient to squeeze their fingers, but this is testing the long flexors of the forearm and they are not affected in an upper motor neuron problem. The only reason to grab the hand like this and shake hands with the patient is that you might see a prominent grasp reflex in someone who's a bit demented 
like David here sometimes when he's working in action emergency. So we've looked at occipital lobe, parietal lobe, frontal lobe, again another frontal lobe sign, weakness of finger extension. If you do not find weakness of finger extension, there will not be any weakness anywhere else and you don't need to examine anywhere else. On the other hand, if you do find weakness of finger extension, then what you would do next is chest biceps, bend your elbow up towards you, because that should be strong with an upper motor neuron problem, but deltoid may be weak. That's the next muscle to go with an upper motor neuron problem, and the third muscle to go if it becomes more severe is extension of the elbow, straighten your elbow. One mistake a number of doctors make when they're testing triceps is to bend the elbow too much, try and straighten your arm. And you can see even someone who's got normal strength can't straighten their arm if you bend the elbow too much, whereas if you have it at right angles, straighten your arm, then you can test it normally. So that's how we would test for upper motor neuron weakness in the arms. The next part of the examination is just the reflexes. Just hit the brachioradialis just over the radius. And David doesn't have wrist reflexes. You can go on to do biceps with your thumb over the biceps tendon and the best way to test triceps is to put the arm across like that and tap the triceps reflex like that, okay? You could test proprioception quickly by just closing the eye and asking the patient which way do you move the finger, up or down? Up. Up. Always do it twice in the same direction because some patients guess and they go up, down, up, down, up, down and coincides with the way you move the finger. Vibration, tuning fork on the finger in a young person, uh, tell me when it stops. Stop. And that's pretty easy. Do you feel that cold? Yes. And testing pain sensation, you tap two or three times with a finger and then two or three times with a pin and ask if it's sharp or dull. What's that? Not. That? Sharp. It's very easy if you tap two or three times. Now that doesn't take very long and you've done a very good examination of the upper limbs okay and you've looked we go over it again we've looked at occipital lobe, parietal lobe, frontal lobe and cerebellum in just about six tests. We can do that in the legs but we'll show you that shortly because while we've got David still sitting up you just want to do a little bit more in the cranial nerves and that is you want to look at eye movements and the best way to look at eye movements is across, up, down and then across, up, down. Ask the patient if they see double in any direction. If they don't, there's no impairment of ocular movements. Ask the patient to show you their teeth and their tongue and say, ah. Uh -huh. The eye movements have looked at the midbrain, third and fourth cranial nerves, the pons, sixth cranial nerve. The face has looked at the pons, the tongue and the palate have looked at the medulla. So you've very quickly done a scan down the brainstem. When we want to look for upper motor neuron weakness in the lower limbs, the first place that will be affected is hip flexion. So if you lift your leg up for me straight, keep it there. I know that if I put my hand just above the kneecap, I can't overcome strength in a normal person. And you push down as hard as you can, and that should be normal. If you do not find weakness of hip flexion, there is no weakness anywhere else in the leg if it's an upper motor neuron problem. On the other hand, if it's a lower motor neuron problem, either in the leg or the arm, then you need to approach the examination differently. And what you would do there is go from where you find an area of weakness and examine every muscle until you find normality. Now that's a bit beyond you, so that's when you call the neurologist. I'm not going to demonstrate reflexes or sensation or anything else in the lower limbs, okay? It's pretty similar to what I showed you in the arms. The last test that we can do in the lower limbs and the upper limbs is to look for cerebellar dysfunction. Now most people ask the patient to lift their leg, put it on the kneecap and then slide it down the shin, but people can lock their heel into their shin and disguise the ataxia that you may see unless it's very severe. The most important thing when you're testing cerebellar function is to ask the patient to lift their leg up very high in the air, lift up for a bit, David, and put that heel accurately on your kneecap. It's that movement coming down that you want to watch. Because if someone has cerebellar dysfunction, it'll come down like that. And then they may be able to disguise it by hooking their heel into their shin, 
but if it's very severe, then as you go down the shin, of course, you'll have the ataxia. In the upper limbs, we ask the patient to put their hands up like this for us, do that for us, and with your eyes closed, with the eyes closed, of course, we're testing two things. We're testing proprioception and cerebellar. But if it's normal with the eyes closed, put that tip of your finger on the tip of your nose, then you know the patient doesn't have a cerebellar problem or a proprioceptive problem. On the other hand, if it's abnormal with the eyes closed, and then you ask the patient to open their eyes and it's normal, then you're dealing with a proprioceptive problem, not a cerebellar function problem. If it's abnormal, with both the eyes open and closed, it's likely to be a cerebellar problem. So we've just shown you in the space of about five or 10 minutes, how you can do about 10 or 12 parts of the neurology examination and have covered virtually the whole of the brain, brainstem and cerebellum. And then you can ring your neurologist and show off all the neurological signs you've found.